All right, so let's continue with this presentation and get to the end of the cell um, communication talk that we've been talking about. And so again, we've been talking about the three basics in the transduction pathway. We have reception, the transduction of the signal through the membrane, and of course, that chemical signaling that leads to the response. So we get, again, it's very important to understand there's reception, there's transduction, that's kind of like a conduction of the signal through the extracellular to the intracellular. And then of course, that signaling through the membrane, but not by it traveling through, okay, causes this amplification of the signal to eventually lead to that response. Oftentimes that response could be producing some chemical that will turn on an operon, right? Will bind to a, um, an inducer and uh, make sure that that regulatory protein that's upstream doesn't bind to the operator region so that you can do what? Have some tran uh, transcription, okay? And again, make a messenger RNA and that of course can make a protein or what have you, or so many other things. Turn on and other chemicals to elicit another response, all right? And as we talked about yesterday, that could also, you know, uh, a growth factor could tell um, the cell cycle, once it gets that chemical signal, to do what? To uh, get past a checkpoint and start mitosis. I mean, this whole bunch of cell responses, whatever the job of the cell is, okay, and what it does. And we're gonna learn today that that response could also be to tell the cell to uh, commit cell suicide. As we're gonna learn today, something called cell apoptosis, a fun word to say like plasma desmata. So we'll talk about that. But in any case, getting back to transduction, there's a cascade of interactions of relay signals. Once we have that reception, once there's transduction, and again, can't say enough, this allosteric change, once there's a specific chemical that specifically binds to that receptor, it doesn't have, this receptor isn't uh, an acme receptor that can receive any signal, it's, it's specific. And of course, I'm simplifying the three-dimensional structure, but the three-dimensional structures have to fit, have to be um, worked together. And then of course, that's gonna cause this change, and that change is where the transduction signal can pass through, and of course, it's somehow gonna catalyze the production or activate the secondary messenger, okay? So signal transduction usually involves multiple steps, multiple pathways can amplify. Now, I'm showing you one step, but there could be other different pathways that interrelate. Maybe one signal can coordinate with a different signal. As I'm showing you a cascading effect, there's gonna be interdependence uh, upon other pathways. You know, there's thousands of thousands of reactions going on. So these reactions that are now stimulated can also interact, okay, and catalyze other reactions to go. And this idea of, of not just having this set of reactions or these reactions occurring with other reactions make the cell interdependent, or I should say, um, work together. Homeostasis can work. There's um, a flow here. Uh, these things don't happen by themselves. They work with other chemical reactions and support other systems. Any case, um, multi-step pathways can amplify the signal. It's important to realize that you know one receptor with one chemical messenger can, because of this amplification that we talked about yesterday, can cause a tremendously fast response by the cell. And sometimes that response has to be quick. Hey, that fight or flight response we talked about yesterday has to happen quickly. We can't wait hours or we're gonna be someone's lunch, okay? So having that, remember, humans used to be the prey, okay? Um, any case, multi-step pathways provide more opportunities for coordination regulation. That's important because as we've talked about before, when it comes to enzymes and pathways, and we saw this uh, last night when uh, we talked about negative feedback of hormones in the uh, menstrual cycle, okay, hey, these chemicals can interact and maybe start a whole set of other chemical reactions, and these chemical reactions can what? All right, catalyze other chemicals that may come back to what? Uh, uh, stop these, 
And so there's regulation when you have multiple pathways, as I, as I showed you with the cellular respiration, okay? So it isn't just this one set of reactions. They're, they're coordinating with the other reactions, and the products of this transduction pathway, okay, are incorporated into other pathways. And so that's how the cell regulates. Can't have all of one thing. The cell just does one thing. Okay, it would of course die. It has to have some control and balances. And those are the other chemicals that are influenced here. All right, but multiple steps, definitely. This happens in multiple steps pretty darn quickly. And we talked about yesterday, you have secondary messengers that allow that to happen. You know, cyclic amp, okay, is one very important secondary messenger, and it's a very small water-soluble compound that can move. If it's always about big proteins, they can't move through the cytosol as well. All right, so let's continue on this fun-filled tour, okay? Um, of course, they re relay a signal from the receptor and to response, and it's like a falling domino effect, okay? One re the receptor activates one protein when it activates another, and it keeps going, but again, it cascades out, all right? And of course, at each step, the signal is transduced into a different form, usually a change of a shape of protein. So as we talk about this activating this protein, it's a transformational change that maybe creates an active site. A lot of times that active site or that change of shape is due to something called substrate level phosphorylation. Remember we talked about glycolysis and adding a phosphate group? Well, a lot of this, cascading reapplication where these steps or these protein kinases are involved with adding phosphate groups to these protein structures that activate them, change their shape, okay? So something we've talked about, all right, as again. So again, here we go, protein phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. The protein phosphorylation actually activates these uh, multi-steps and dephosphorylation, dephosphorylation, okay, inactivates them. There has to be some kind of off switch here. We just can't be an on switch that, that's tremendously fast. Remember we talked about epinephrine, you can't have your metabolism racing like a car. And so there has to be some way to turn this off. And one of the ways is dephosphorylation. And oftentimes that process is linked to the other chemicals it's interconnected with. All right. Any case, moving forward, and uh, protein phosphatases, okay, and there's an ACE, so you know it's a protein. Remove the phosphates from proteins, process called dephosphorylation. And of course, this is like a molecular sh uh, switch. It slows the process down. You have to have, if you're gonna have a signal, you're gonna have to have some sort of termination or control of that, that signal. Just can't be, hey, it's on and we explode and that's it, okay? So, and here we go with the signaling protein, the transduction, and here comes the chemical signaling. This is part of the transduction, by the way, right? I mean, this, we have the physical reception, okay, and then we have the signal, okay, traveling through the cell to eventually get to the response, okay? And if you notice inactive protein kinases, they get a phosphate, and now they're active, and then they do what? This cascading of phosphorylation goes down. Now, this is not just one cell, it, it grows outward pretty darn fast as we talked about, okay? And of course, we have these secondary messages. Uh, the extracellular that we hold as the ligand, okay, that binds is the first messenger. The secondary messenger is what gets activated, you know, through that transformational change of maybe the uh, G protein, okay, um, uh, GPCRs and RTKs, these are diff different type of receptors that's in your book. All right, and they're, they're small, they're, they're non-protein, and they're water-soluble. They can quickly move out, okay? There's also uh, calcium ions that we're going to see in our last little piece of a unit uh, in nerves as we see the transmission of signals through nerve fibers. And of course, here are our other types. Cyclic AMP is one of the most widely used secondary messengers. It's the one used in the epinephrine. And adenylene cyclase, as we know, that's a membrane-bound um, uh, enzyme that was part of your um, transduction signal, okay, for epinephrine as well. It's epinephrine as well. So it's enzyme in the plasma membrane that converts ATP to cyclic. So we have this adenylene cyclase that sits actually in the membrane, and it was activated by a G protein in the epinephrine 
um, signal, as you guys have learned. Okay, so this is all stuff that should be making sense. Now, as I said yesterday, we have to have some thinking about an off switch and termination sequence. Um, we know that the this adenylene cyclase that sits as a membrane bound um, um, enzyme that's activated by a G protein, okay, that will, will convert the uh, um, ATP into a cyclic AMP, which which again starts that signaling, okay, uh, gets changed by something called phosphodiesterase into AMP, and that's kind of an off switch in the epinephrine cycle. And as I said yesterday, caffeine will block, caffeine will bl will bind to this. I'm not sure if it's competitive or non-competitive inhibitor. Uh, my guess would be competitive, but I don't know for sure. It blocks phosphodiesterase, so that's why caffeine kind of stimulates you. We naturally produce epinephrine by our own emotions, and I guess the buildup of that effect gives you that stimulus effect by keeping by having the cyclic AMP and still creating the same responses in the cell. All right, cool beans. All right, so moving forward. Okay, there are many signal molecules that trigger the formation of cyclic AMP. Other components of cyclic AMP are the G proteins we talked about. It activates protein kinases, all right? And of course, there's further regulation of the cell metabolism provided by G proteins. So there's all kinds of regulation and interwoven dependence of all the reactions that go on here to control for this. We just can't have runaway on and off switches, okay? And so, again, that's just the epinephrine pathway that you learn, obviously very simplified. Okay, this cellular response secondary message, this would be a blown out cascade, okay? But it's important to see that. I'm driving this home because this is a huge, huge big deal when it comes to understanding all of the chemical signaling um, in the cell. Can't say enough how the AP will rest its hat on these types of, uh, of understandings, and you'll see that when we review. Okay, now I bring back up glycolysis because we talked about uh, negative feedback loops in phosphofructokinase, which was the regulatory protein early on in glycolysis that could be inhibited if we don't need energy. So we, we don't need energy if ATP backs up, doesn't get used, then by diffusion gets back to and becomes a non-competitive inhibitor to phosphofructokinase. And, basically binds to it and then it changes its active site so it no longer can catalyze the, the reaction in the sequence of events in glycolysis and shuts it down. Uh, also citrate, one of the uh, compounds, one of the frag compounds in the uh, Krebs cycle, if, it's, if the Krebs cycle is not working, well that's just going to come out of the mitochondria into the cytosol. Remember this doesn't occur in the mitochondria, right? And it'll do the same thing. Now I bring this back because it, where does uh, AMP, adenosine monophosphate, if we have it, that's usually because we've been cleaving what? We've been cleaving the other phosphates. Now we know we do that, of course, a little bit, okay, in these pathways, but hey, if you, need, if you have a high energy demand, you're gonna cleave the ATP and the ADP, and that's where we've talked about that previously. So just trying to show you how this all fits together, because these reactions are occurring in the cytosol while these are going, okay? And so we know that uh, having AMP being made, okay, can f stimulate that. For instance, if you're going to have um, some coffee or caffeine, what's a coffee caffeine going to do? Well, the caffeine, well, I'm sorry, will block this, and therefore you may be stopping the amount of AMP there. But phosphodiesterase normally will do what? Produce a lot of AMP, and that could stimulate the starting of glycolysis. I, it, it just shows you that these things are not happening in vacuums, they're interconnected, the best that I can show you. All right. All right. So again, we talk about growth factors. You'll hear about Mr. Grotsky, what's a growth factor? Um, well, chemists, or I'm sorry, biologists, when they study these chemical signals, they tend to call them growth factors because the first ones discovered definitely help the cell grow and it's kind of, uh, they have, I don't know, hundreds of them now, I believe. And so it's just a general way to call these chemical signals growth factors when in fact a lot of them don't actually mean that the cell's growing. But again, same idea. And again, the response, of course, for a lot of these is to turn on a part of the genome that the cell already has 
to make a certain protein or do a certain job or do something. Sometimes it changes shape only. In any case, many different types of responses. Okay, and here's another showing you how this cascading binding of epinephrine to G protein couple receptors, one molecule. And what does that result in? 10 to the eight molecules. Look, we had a transduction. And what is transduction? Once I go through the receptor in an inactive G protein, okay, that's a peripheral protein, okay, becomes 100 molecules. So we activate 100 molecules from one receptor. And then we go to what? Okay, we, then of course, the inactive adenine cyclase that does what? Makes the cyclic AMP, which of course, okay, makes what? 10 to the four, all right, 10,000 of them. And that cyclic AMP, that chemical messenger, which is what, water soluble, can go through and find these inactive protein kinases, big, that phosphorylate for us. And of course, now we're gonna make 10 to the sixth. Okay, now we got a million of these active uh, substrates that eventually make what? 10 million molecules. In this case, I'm showing you the pathway of how the uh, binding in epinephrine will actually stimulate the response of, of um, what's that, uh, 10 million, 100 million, I'm sorry, 100 million uh, glucose molecules that are stored in the liver as glycogen. And again, that's a response you should understand and putting more glucose into the, what, bloodstream real quickly, okay? So one epinephrine molecule in a very fast response will release, what, 100 million glucose molecules, okay? And it better be fast because we need that response fast to get away from that cheetah that's running, okay, after us. All right, that's a really important slide right there. Okay, now we've talked about positive gene regulation before, and I'm just going to quickly go through this because you need to know it, and it's important, okay. Um, generally speaking, because this is where you're going to see this as well, that cyclic AMP that's a chemical secondary messenger also helps getting into the nucleus. So if you're gonna produce a lot of the cyclic AMP, it's also a messenger that gets in the nucleus. Now in terms of E. coli, because we're really living in the eukaryote range where we have um, uh, usually transcription factors. We talk about the cell response. It's important that we're talking mostly about eukaryotes here. Um, and instead of, you turn on a genome by a transcription factor. And that factor again is another protein that's made <clears throat> that binds to a particular spot on the genome, like the Tata box, that helps the RNA polymerase bind to the promoter region and make the messenger RNA. But if you remember an E. coli, okay, this is the LAC operon. Remember the LAC operon is the operon that produces the genes to break down lactose. Now lactose isn't a form of sugar that E. coli prefer to use. They're evolutionary um, prefer and efficiently use glucose better. So it's, but if you have no glucose, a lactose will have to do. Now, we have this LACI, a regulatory gene, upstream. That's what a lot of these, what, cell responses do. They deal with this LACI. Now, if you remember, okay, the LAC operon is, remember, breaking down. So this is, this is catabolic. We wanna break something down. Okay, so we're gonna, this, is usually in the off position, uh, is in the off position, and they say, so well, why is catabolic pathways or catabolic operons in the off position? Well, it is because why would I keep this gene on, use resources, if I don't have any lactose available? So you keep it off, which means the RNA polymerase can't bind, which means the LAC-I, which is the regulatory gene up, upstream, when it's made, binds to the what? the operator region and blocks the RNA polymerase, okay? Now, if you have lactose, if you remember, that's an inducer, allolactose is also present, it binds to the LAC-I, and allosterically, here we go again with the same information, change the shape, and what? It can't bind there. And if it can't bind there, what happens? Well, RNA polymerase can now transcribe, make messenger RNA, which leads to the proteins. Now, positive gene control means, hey, what if I wanna turn that volume up? What if I wanna make more? Because RNA polymerase still is gonna bind and not bind. So what we do is, or what evolution has made is we have these cap proteins, 
okay? And these cat proteins, when they have cyclic ANP, that secondary messenger binds to it, it changes its shape so that it binds to part of the promoter region that helps, helps RNA polymerase bind. I'm sorry, this is the operator region where the lac I would normally bind. I'm sorry if I was pointing to that. So, so we talked about this. So cyclic ANP as a secondary messenger could work itself into the what? Into the, into the nucleus, okay? And help spur the increase of lactose as a response, an E. coli, let's say. Obviously, there's no nucleus here, but I'm giving you the idea. So, so in any case, cyclic ANP would bind to something called cat protein, which allows it to bind. Without the cyclic ANP, this can't bind, this can't help. So the idea is that this is a, an operon that's on, but the positive control is having cyclic ANP, and by the way, having cyclic ANP usually means that you're in a case of low glucose. Why? Because you have adenosine triphosphate was cleaved to ADP, and on a high energy demand, ADP is cleaved and you're left with cyclic AMP. So cyclic AMP usually means that you have low glucose, which is tells this cell to, to turn up the volume, which means it'll bind to this protein, which will now be activated to kind of help get the RNA polymerase there. And of course, if glucose is present, this cell wants to be efficient, you're not gonna have this cyclic AMP anymore, so it comes off or less of it. I mean, this goes on and goes off, so having less of it means it doesn't go on as much, and this guy doesn't have the cyclic AMP. It doesn't bind to the promoter region, and even though this might be on, it doesn't run or it doesn't um, transcribe as much because it, RNA polymerase doesn't have the extra help to help it bind. So something we've talked about, but something I want to show you where these chemicals come from, all right? So in any case, moving forward. Oh. All right. Now, all organs must regulate which genes are expressed at a given time, and we just talked about that with the lac operons. And multicellular organs, unlike the E. coli we just talked about, regulation of gene expression is essential for cell specialization. This is important. When cells get specialized, they kind of turn off different parts. Okay, and that's really what happens as we differentiate from a stem cell that can be any that can be every cell into a specialized cell like a beta cell in your pancreas. Okay, and although that's a big part of research to figure out what turns them off, okay, this specialization is important, and so we regulate that different ways. Okay, and we do so a lot of times with these growth factors or things that come and tell the cell it's time for you to change, okay? So embryonic development is something we're gonna talk about today a little bit. And so in any case, um, this is another way, uh, another diagram talking about um, uh, uh, ion channels that we're gonna turn off. I'm gonna leave this for another discussion. We should also know that gated ion channels are another way that we um, can uh, send signals, and that's with the nerve cells. And I'm gonna leave that for our last little unit, but just be aware that's there, so I'm gonna go through this. Calcium acts as a second, calcium plus two is an important secondary messenger in many pathways, especially in skeletal muscle. The ability to flex a muscle or move our skeletal muscles or contract them to move our bones in our body are due to um, calcium ions as a secondary messenger. We'll talk more about that when we get to those points. Okay, so I'm getting through these very cell, these, these we don't need. Okay, and again, cell signaling leads to a regulation of transcription or cytoplasmic activity. It's not always you know, regulating a gene. It could just be to just turn on enzymes to make that enzymes already there. As we're going to learn, there are already proteins inside cells that are death factors, meaning every cell has factors or, or, or these kind of death proteins that are sitting there to be activated. And when they are activated, they cause the cell to undergo cell suicide, which is important for the regulation of an organism to get rid of cells that are not functioning or if they're damaged uh, and or, you know, they run their course. You know, red blood cells, I believe, for 60 days or so. So over time, you have to make sure that we have the cells that are doing very important jobs, especially the transport of oxygen, all right, that are, that are working optimally, okay? Um, any case. So ultimately, this signaling transduction pathway leads to regulation of one or more cell activities. And of course, it's important that they occur in the cellulose. 
I'm sorry, in the cytoplasm or in the nucleus. Of course, in the nucleus, it could be a transcription factor if you're a eukaryote and turn on a gene. And of course, many of these pathways regulate the synthesis of enzymes or other proteins. Remember, by turning genes off, there's so much interdependence of these reactions, okay, uh, getting off this, all right? So uh, also, there's ones that can affect the shape as well, all right? And getting through this, it's important that there's a fine-tuning of the response, and this is really important. There are four aspects of fine-tuning of the response. First of all, there's the amplification of the signals we talked about very quickly. There's the specificity of the response, meaning that response is unique to the receptor, okay? Although there could be many responses, that response only occurs with that singular receptor, although that may be happening, okay? Uh, of course, we have efficiency of the response by these scaffolding proteins. I didn't mention these, but these are proteins that help with this relaying, okay, of this cascade effect or the amplification. And of course, very importantly, you have to have a termination of a signal. You can't have a signal that's on. We talked about positive, talked about that there could be some negative feedback of turning or dephosphorylating, but you have to have some termination somehow of the signal, okay? So let's quickly go over these important facts here. Okay, enzyme cascade amplifies the cell's response each step. Okay, and the number of activated. So um, we know that different kinds of cells have different collections of proteins, and this is really important. You know, we talked about epinephrine. We know that epinephrine, there's going to be these certain types of receptors that for the epinephrine that are specific for epinephrine. But different cells, okay, use different parts of their genome that produce different proteins. So although we may have the same, uh, you know, G protein receptor complex here and the same adenylene cy cyclase there. We still might make the same, we will, the cyclic AMP. These different proteins that the cell has will lead to a different cellular response, even though we have the same what? Receptor. And that's important for that cell. And we talked about that. The, the, the cells in your heart or the cells in the, uh, the artery part of your blood vessels tend to constrict, okay, with epinephrine. But the same smooth muscles that constrict in your arteries, okay, relax, okay, in your bronchial, bronchial tubes or in your, um, your lungs. So with the same receptor because different cells have different what? Different proteins, different, second, uh, different cascading effects, okay? And so this is a really important figure here. They all have the same receptor, but because of different proteins, they have different responses. But don't forget these responses are for that cell is specific to that protein. Now, we're talking about cross-talking here. We can have multiple receptors that can what? Work with each other. This is often the case with most things that are going on. They're not just one. Um, you know, receptor, there's all things that are interrelated working together. So the crosstalk between two pathways can regulate each other. Notice this one receives the same signal and it gives this cell two unique responses that these don't have because of different proteins, but these two responses are still what? Specific for the same chemical signal we call a growth factor that could be epinephrine short. Okay, so that's important. And again, these scaffolding proteins are just the proteins that help do this. Now, now important, the termination of the signal. Okay, we have to stop the signal. So the termination normally just means that these things bind and they unbind. They're not permanent bonds that stay there forever. So they come on and they come off. They're specific for the shape of the receptor, as we've talked about, form and function with proteins. So they come on and they come off, these receptors. Now, if these chemical signals, growth factors, like people like to call them, decrease in molarity or concentration, well, if there's far fewer of them because they're decreasing concentration, the blood takes them away, whatever you want to think of, there's less, less of them to go back on. So if there's less of them to go back on, then this signal isn't turned on as much. And that's one of the major ways to turn off the signal, that the ligand, the growth factor, the attaching compound, is coming more off more often now because there's less of them, all right? That's important. It doesn't just stay on, okay? Now, let's talk about cell apoptosis. It's programmed 
or controlled cell suicide. And this happens, or the components of the cell are chopped up when this happens, and they're packaged in vesicles that are digested by scavenger ships. <laughs> so I can speak. So say with me, cell apoptosis. Apoptosis, feels good, like plasma desmata or phosphofructokinase, really some fun words. So we have this cell suicide. Now, when does a cell do that? When it gets a chemical signal to do so. When would it do so? Okay, well, other cells, okay, can see that these cells need to go. And you say, well, how do you know that? Well, I will talk about uh, development of cells. We'll talk about also that those signals can also come from inside. As I said before, we have these secondary messengers or these, these inactive proteins, if you wanna say, that are death signals. And they're just waiting for the time for them to become activated. So every cell, okay, already has death signals in them. And it's a matter of do we have them activated or not, all right? So in any case, apoptosis prevents enzymes for leaking out of the dying cell and damaging neighbors. That's one of the biggest reasons as a cell dies, we know it has lysosomes and all, all kinds of other um, uh, proteases and, and, and nucleases that could become very damaging as they can cut up proteins and nucleotides. So to prevent them from doing that, besides the fact that some cells are losing their ability to do their job very well, it's important to get rid of them, okay? Your skin cells undergo a tremendous amount of cell apoptosis, as we're gonna see today. So it's an important uh, regulation of a multicellular organism to get rid of those cells that are becoming less efficient. Or it's important in the um, uh, um, regulation of your body in terms of, of, hey, that cell's no longer doing its job, all right? Well, and so during this process, cellular agents chop up the DNA and fragment the organelles into cellular components. The cell shrinks and becomes lobed, and cells are packaged in vesicles. They are engulfed and digested by special scavenger cells called phagocytes, okay? Most of the time, white blood cells that we'll talk about in one of our last little units. Mammalian cells make life or death decisions by integrating the death signals or life signals. As I said, all cells have these inactive death compounds in them, all right, that when activated will set a series of reactions that will make a cell response in terms of, of terminating itself Okay, but they also have life signals. And so it's a balance of where they're, what signals they're getting. Okay, so they have these other active sites that sometimes stop the death signals. All right, as we'll see. All right, here's an example of a, uh, a cell that's undergoing cell apoptosis. It's, it's becoming lobed, okay, and those are the vessels it's making. And I think that's a, a live white blood cell, okay. All right, so, uh, apoptosis is important in shaping the organism, as I'm talking about in embryonic development. The role of apoptosis in embryonic development was studied in the C. elegans, that's the, the flatworms, okay? And it results when proteins accelerate apoptosis, override those that put the brakes on apoptosis. We have these factors inside of us, or I should say inside every cell, that when activated will cause a cell to die. We also have factors that stop it. So it's a matter of, hey, what are the overriding factors? It's not just on and off, there is a what? A continuum of interrelated what? Reactions in the cell, okay? Caspases, ACEs, these are things that are proteins or the main proteases, enzymes that cut up proteins, nucleases, proteases that carry out apoptosis. And it can be triggered by an extracellular death signaling ligand, okay? So you get a death signal, okay? It can also be the cell tells itself to die because there's tremendous DNA damage. Okay, as we're going to see in the skin cells that actually protects itself from skin cancers. Uh, and of course, protein misfolding in the endoplasmic reticulum. If you, don't, if you can't, for any reason, fold proteins correctly when you're making proteins in the ribosomes, the rough ER, boy, you're going to cause some major problems in the cell. Okay, so those are the three major reasons why. And so mammalian cells make life or death decisions by somehow integrating the death signals and they receive these external or internal. There's a built-in suicide me mechanism, and we know that occurs in simple yeast, and we know that, it, and yeast, of course, even though it's a single-celled organism, it's a eukaryote, it has uh, organelles, and we know it occurs in the um, single-cell um, prokaryotes, and so because of that, all right, we think, oh, I'm sorry, I misspoke, 
We know it occurs in single cell eukaryotes, and, it and of course it occurs in multicellular fungi, so the basic mechanisms of what evolution state that you know, we still do this because of evolution, that it's somehow it's beneficial to be able to regulate and make life and death decisions for those cells um, that are past their prime, so to speak, okay, and keep the organism working efficiently, all right? And invertebrates, invertebrates like us, apoptosis is essential for normal development of the nervous system, for normal operation of the immune system, okay, uh, and for the normal uh, morphogenesis of the hands. Now, the immune system is important because uh, we have a spleen that basically collects, um, you know, past prime red blood cells and organisms there. In any case, getting back to uh, uh, normal development, the morphogenesis of hands and feet or paws in other animals depends upon uh, apoptosis. So the failure of apoptosis when we have de developmental digits or hands can lead to the following. Okay, so webbed fingers and feet occur because, well, when we first make them, they're all webbed, and of course, to get rid of these cells, we signal these cells to undergo cell apoptosis to separate them. In this case, they did not, okay? And that is where we get that. And we continue on to some other examples. Okay, here's a famous person, I forget his name, but he's showing this person, I'm not sure what he got, clippers, his webbed feet, good for him, I guess. All right, and obviously webbed feet are helpful to swim, but this is just the cell apoptosis didn't work. And then of course, okay, here's another example where developmentally, you know, we should have told these cells to die to separate the fingers. And if you didn't notice my hands, just kidding, my hands, they're not webbed. Okay, you get that. All right, moving forward. And there we go, it's showing you how these digits, okay, we're telling, um, you know, embryonically or, or developmentally, I should say, to get rid of those cells okay in those areas all right and that's what creates that interesting enough if you didn't already know mammals our fetuses look very much the same when we start out okay we, we start as a blastocyte we talked about that uh, last night where it, it binds to the endometrium wall okay placenta is developed that, pro that produces progesterone that maintain the endometrial lining okay but we all look very similar. And how do we come out differently? Well, during development, we tell, okay, different parts of our cells to, to, to change. And that changing could be through either chemical signal, signaling to, to open up different parts of our genome to, be di to differentiate, we call, or a cell apoptosis. So we have the human, the horse, the cat, and the cow. Which one do you think is which? Well, the bigger brain, here's the human. Okay, I'm guessing. I can see hoofs here, so that's the cow. All right, you can see the bigger elongated head, you don't see the hoofs yet, but that bigger tail, that kind of elongated head, there's the horse, and I believe that's the cat. Looks very similar, don't we? Okay, and so how do we change? Through chemical signaling that tells cells to change their shape or their function, or cell apoptosis to kill certain parts off. Notice we have um, very similar structures early on. Okay, now we also know that cell apoptosis may be involved in some diseases, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. These are, um, you know, diseases of the brain that we should be killing off certain cells, yet they're not, so they're contributing um, to some buildup of chemicals, okay? Don't know all there is to know about that, and they may be contributing with some cancers if you have interference. Remember, cell apoptosis, if you've got a problem with your DNA, which is a mutation that could be really lethal or produces what a continuous growth factor is that you grow a tumor that could lead to a cancer where that cell should have killed itself that cell now is producing uh, um, proteins continuously to get itself past the checkpoint and it's continuously undergoing mitosis and that of course is what a tumor is okay and of course in humans there are 15 different caspases that carry out apoptosis one major one is where we have mitochond mitochondrial Protein, cytochrome C is a electron transport protein that can diffuse out, diffuse out and bind with these fa bad factors and cause the cell to die. Okay, so you also, not just having chemical signals that can cause that, um, that response, you can also have an internal signal that can occur. All right, so it can occur from inside the cell or outside the cell. 
All right, so let's talk about skin cells. We're gonna finish this up, we're almost done. We know that UVB is a mutagen. Mutagens are, are things that, with high energy, that can actually change and do what? Break chemical bonds, or break the H bonding in our what? DNA. And when they break them, our body repairs them. But when it repairs them, sometimes that repair, okay, isn't all correct. And we should all know that infrared light is low. These are long wavelengths. These are shorter. And then UVBs are really small wavelengths, high frequency, high energy, and that could break DNA. So we have our skin, our largest organ in our body, and we have our skin cells. A karyotinocyte, okay? And these guys have these nuclei, or their nucleus is in the middle here, and they get damaged a lot by receiving these UVBs. And they damage their what? They damage their, um, their DNA. And we recognize that by telling the cells that have damaged DNA either undergo, hey, repair that DNA, or if it's not repairable, kill off those cells. Who has had sunburn? Sunburn is when your cells flake off because we told those cells to die because those cells we think have damaged DNA and those cells could have damaged DNA to what? To produce a cyclin or a growth factor that may have continuous what? Mitosis and grow a tumor and that's how cancer results. Now the DNA damage isn't always in that region but it could happen just by chance. So it's important you recognize that. Okay, so apoptosis are both clearly adaptive to this, this thing. Okay, so here is our skin cells, okay? And so our skin cells are right here, all right? We have some white blood cells, even though it's not white, that live in our skin cells. We have this lamella granules, which are basically made from the skin cell. It's kind of a, a barrier. It's a hydrophobic barrier, so to speak. It's basically made up of lipids, and it prevents water flow, so we don't lose our water from our body as much. And then of course we have, well, dead skin cells. Why are they dead? Well, they lost their what? Function. And so they get pushed through. And we know that those that they flake off. You itch, you have ashes, or most of the dust in your house is due to the flaking off of these dead cells that were told to die by cell apoptosis, some local chemical signaling. But we also have these melanocytes. And these are cells that give our skin color, and more importantly, what they are is they are actually very helpful in protecting our cells of our skin from UV radiation, okay? So I think I'm gonna play a, a video now. From melanocyte to melanoma. Melanocytes are cells that produce melanin, a brown-black pigment that determines the color They're of the skin, our skin hair, cells. And eyes, they work and with our skin cells. helps to guard against the damaging function. effects of the sun. In the skin, melanocytes are positioned at the epidermal dermal junction, appearing as rounded cell bodies with long irregular extensions called dendrites. The formation of melanin occurs in the cell body in an intracytoplasmic membrane bound organelle called the melanosome. So that happens in the cell Next, of the melanocyte. The melanosome is transported by microtubules oh, through the surface the of the melanocyte a to a neighboring keratinocyte. Melanosomes have been released into the matrix of the cytoplasm in the keratinocyte and accumulate in the supernuclear region so of the cytoplasm, shoot their, what, thereby protecting the nuclei of the cells into the cells the damaging the top of, the of, the, of these cells Several to factors protect such them. as heritable predisposition and genetic mutations increase the risk of malignant melanoma. Ultraviolet UV radiation, such as that emitted by the sun, is directly absorbed by DNA and is a major risk factor for all types of skin cancer, including malignant melanoma. When UV radiation is absorbed by a double bond in a thymine base, the double bond opens, allowing the base to react with nearby molecules. If a UV-modified thymine base is adjacent to another thymine base on the same DNA strand, the two molecules can form a thymine dimer as a result of covalent bonding. The reaction most often involves the formation of two new bonds between neighboring bases, mutation a membered ring. The structural consequences of a UV-induced reaction include local distortions in the helix and a caking in the DNA strand. If UV-related damage is not corrected by molecular repair mechanisms, DNA transcription and replication are blocked, and genetic information may be permanently mutated. 
Genetic mutations in melanocytes are associated with histologic changes along a continuum that may culminate in invasive malignancy. The transition from a normal melanocyte to metastatic melanoma may involve several histologic intermediates, including a typical dysplastic nevus of varying stages of severity, or melanoma in situ, and invasive melanoma. Indeed, melanomas diagnosed and treated during the radial growth phase have been shown to have an excellent prognosis. Currently, there is no cure for late-stage melanoma. As a result, early detection plays a critical role in reducing melanoma morbidity and mortality. New diagnostic tools to complement the visual examination of lesions, especially early-stage melanoma and borderline lesions, and those that lack the classic appearance of melanoma, could significantly enhance the detection process. Okay, so all that tells us is that um, so you, some people have more melanin than other people, and of course, having more melanin gives us a more darker or lighter or less li uh, melanin, gives us a different complexion or depth, but really the melanin there is nothing more than a protection for our skin cells, and um, it's an evolutionary adaptation to uh, higher and higher amounts of UVB rays. And depending upon where you live in the world depends upon how much melanin you have. And the melanocytes just basically are there to produce, if you didn't know, that pigment to cover and protect our nuclei of our, um, our skin cells. And of course, the more you have, the better it is, okay? But the more important part is that when skin cells do get damaged by UVB, we do have a mechanism to get rid of those cells and if they're damaged and still, and, and again, the, the um, mutation or mutagen effects of that high energy UVB could cause a mutation or as have you in an area that causes uncontrollable cell growth because it produces an uncontrollable amount of cyclin, okay, or a growth factor that's produced too much to nearby cells. Or there's so many different combinations of why that we disrupt this balance and we get past that, that growth cycle checkpoint. Don't forget, mitosis is here. We've got G1, okay? We've got the S phase in G2, and there's that G1 checkpoint, and there's the M checkpoint. And these checkpoints are mediated by certain levels of compounds that could be what? changed by growth factors making more of those compounds and of course you have to understand that cancer normally is about unchecked uh, cell growth that there isn't any stop factors because of something wrong okay normally with uh, our dna that makes too much of a factor that makes too much of a relay chemical that does that so another example of this cell apoptosis we talked about the follicle okay and then during ovulation, we have the spike of the FSH and luteinizing hormone that ejects the um, uh, egg out of the follicle. We have this corpus luteum, lute luteum that remains, okay? But because the decrease in the LH and the FSH that results from negative feedback of the estrogen hitting the anterior uh, pituitary gland this dies off, it needs FSH to live. Okay, now of course if the uh, egg is fertilized, okay, these would increase, or the progesterone would increase, but any case, without a fertilized egg, okay, this is going to wither and eventually die. So there's an example of atrophy and cell death that's important, that, or at least that part of that. Remember, we have all these little cells inside that support that cell, you know, the granulosa cells and the outside cells, uh, the luteum, I, I, something with an L, okay? Any case, that being said, uh, something we've seen before, and this regulation that we have inside the cell that's interconnected with negative feedback occurs with bigger molecules outside the cell in long distance passageway. And here's an example of regulation of hormones that work together, and we have many different uh, examples of that. We don't have to know all the particulars of all of these for our test, but just understand how they do work in unison. Another pathway, of course, is the insulin glucose levels, and we'll talk more about glycogen or glucagon, okay, how they work together is another example of a form that's coming up, okay? So just going quickly, one last point, talk about other types of development, 
okay, is, okay, the growth cycle of the painted lady, okay? So the life cycle, we're dealing with larvae, and I know you're not here, but they're growing, and I want to show you that, uh, at least in pictures at the end of today a little bit, and give you your measurements. I'm going to show you how something that you probably don't recognize or can't understand, not can't understand, but probably didn't expect to see, all right? So our caterpillars are growing, they're getting bigger, they're more mitosis, there's probably a tremendous amount of growth factor stimulating, okay, uh, to get past this checkpoint pretty fast. During the process, we're molting, okay, the exoskeleton shell and we're getting rid of cell. There's some cell apoptosis going on. How does this larva um, uh, change into a butterfly when it's in its chrysalis at some point during the cycle? Hopefully I can show you that you're back in school. We'll see. So how do we get from here to here? There's definitely differentiation going on, and we're getting rid of some parts of the what? Caterpillar to become something. So there's tremendous amount of cell apoptosis that's going on in the development phase. And that concludes today's lecture.